Welcome to Christ Community Church. My name is Bryant, and we are really excited that you're here today, especially if you're new. We know how intimidating it can be to be in a new place with all kinds of new people, so we just want to give you a quick rundown of what to expect today during service. In a few moments, our music team is going to come out on stage and lead us in worship by singing a few songs together. Then, a little bit later in our service, we're going to hear a great message from one of our teaching pastors as we continue in our current series, The Story. We still have a few minutes before service begins, so check out what's happening this week at CCC. If you helped out with the Mission Church Christmas store by either bringing in items or signing up to volunteer at the store, thank you. Because of your generosity, hundreds of under-resourced families in North Omaha will have the opportunity to provide Christmas for their families this year in a dignified way. If you picked up a list and you haven't brought in your item yet, no problem. You can bring in those items today or sometime during this week by Friday. Bringing the gospel of Jesus to the least reached places of the world is at the heart of who we are at CCC. Throughout the year, we have several short-term mission trip opportunities that you can be a part of. And one of those trips is coming up this spring to Cuba. If you'd like more information about how you can get signed up to be a part of this trip, you can go online or head out to the info center today after service. Today is the anniversary to the first Big Give Sunday of Beyond Belief, a two-year vision where we are trusting God to do more than we could ever ask or imagine in our city and around the world. We have a lot to celebrate for what's already happened here at CCC in year one of Beyond Belief, and we're so excited about what is yet to come. As we begin our service, check out this special celebration video, and if you'd like more information about anything we've talked about today, you can go online or download the CCC app. We're at the midpoint of kind of a vision moment for our church, and the idea behind it is that God is inviting us to become a people beyond belief. It's not just about believing the right things, but it's moving beyond belief to full surrender. During this beyond belief time, we have just taken our faith to the next level by just being disciplined, probably for the first time in our lives, definitely the first time in our marriage of reading our Bible, reading our Bible together, listening to sermons together, and it has just been the biggest growth year for my spirituality. Jesus said, whoever wants to save his life must lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus invites you to sell out to him 100% with nothing being held back. Christ Community Church, what you're part of is something very significant and you keep being part of it. The whole concept that the command to love and the commission to go has been given to people like us and we get to be full participants in it. Beyond Belief really is our opportunity to recognize that God is bigger than we can even imagine or dream. Our dream as a church is not to become just a big healthy church. But we believe that God has put us in the middle of the city of Omaha strategically because he wants Omaha and Council Bluffs and Blair and Bennington and Bellevue to all hear the good news of Jesus. May our magnificent God take us beyond belief at home, in our city, and around the world. Yeah, that's, that's a great video. It just reminds me again, and I even serve here, all the things that are going on here at Christ Community Church. I mean, in our student ministry, uh, overseas, in Village One, and right here uh, at Christ Community Church. And it's exciting to be a part of. And we're halfway through our Beyond Belief vision, and uh, hope you're on board for the ride. Welcome, everybody. We did it. We're here. We're here. And uh, yeah, and I was, I was telling the choir and the orchestra beforehand, I said, uh, you know, I was just thanking them for making whatever extra effort they had to make to be here. And, and I said, you know, maybe our numbers are down a little bit today, but those who have come, those who have come have made extra effort to be here and they're expecting to hear from God today and they're here for a reason and they're ready to worship the Lord. So yes, our numbers are down a little bit, but I see some of our better singers uh, are here. And so I think that our time of worship is gonna be wonderful today. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Shall we do that? 
Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we come and we bow before you, and we crown you King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we do come today with expectant hearts and anticipating a wonderful time of worship. And uh, so meet with us through your Holy Spirit. Your Holy Spirit is welcome in our presence today. Come and guide and direct and give us extra measures of wisdom. Convict us of our sin. I encourage us. Strengthen our faith. And we look forward to what you're going to do in us and through us today as we gather on this first Sunday of Advent. Amen and amen. This morning is the first Sunday of Advent. As you can see, the candles are down here in front of, of me. And Advent is a, a period of time on the church calendar when, when Christians, followers of Jesus, as we look forward to Christmas Day, we have these weeks together where we anticipate. We anticipate and we celebrate the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And also during these days, we will look forward to his second coming of, of Jesus. And so the candles that we have in front of us will light a new one each week. And they represent joy and, and hope and love and peace. And God sent the Lord Jesus Christ to bring these beautiful things before us. And so the cry of the church in this anticipation for Christmas Day is uh, perfectly stated in this next Advent hymn. Come, thou long expected Jesus, who was born to set our people free. So let us lift our voices as we anticipate Christmas Day and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come. Come.
you were going to sing Christmas music this morning when you came. Ah, yes, yes. Well, why don't you turn and greet one another as you're being seated this morning. Say hello and good morning. You can be seated. Okay. How is your reading coming on the story? Uh, if it's not going very well, that's okay. Just pick it up this week. We're in, we just finished chapter 15, and uh, the name of it was God's Messengers. If you have your story book, get it out right now. Yes, get it out. And turn to page 211. If you have your Bible, or there's a Bible underneath your seat, and you'd like to uh, follow along with my reading, you find that in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 17. 2 Kings chapter 6, and, or you can just listen as I read. You know, I know I find it meaningful, and I know that you do too. Sometimes when we sing a back, we, we tell a backstory to a hymn or a song. Where did that song come from? How did it originate? And the song that we're going to sing next, it's not a Christmas song, but the song that we're going to sing next it comes straight from the Word of God. Uh, it, the story comes straight from God's Word, and it happens to be in chapter 15 that we are reading or have read uh, this past week. And so I'd like to read that portion of the story. You can follow along. It's on the, the bottom third of page 211, or again, 2 Kings 6, starting with verse 8. And let's hear this story. The backstory: story, uh, the prophet Elijah has gone up to heaven, and he has... Uh, passed on his work to Elisha, Elisha. And so this is a story uh, with the prophet Elijah. Listen carefully. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. And after conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. Well, the man of God, Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, beware of the passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Oh, this enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? Oh, none of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who was in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Well, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. And the report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. Well, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early in the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Oh, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. Oh, open his eyes, Lord, so that we may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked. And he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So even though we can't see, you know, with our natural eyes, the Lord God, the, the Lord of hosts, he is continually watching over his people. And he has, as we call it, an invisible army. An invisible army at his bidding that he can send out anytime, anywhere, any place. Someone once said, God's angels watch over God's people as they do God's work. So may the reading of God's word be of encouragement to us this morning. The choir and orchestra are going to begin this next song 
and then I'll cue you when it's time for you to join with us.
dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this sweet time of worship this morning and remembering your wonderful promises to us and that you and your angels watch over us continually. Ah, that is just strength in my faith this morning. And so thank you for that promise and that truth. And may we now have open eyes and ears for what you would have us for the rest of this service today. I think God brought us here for a reason and we uh, look forward to to that and the rest of the time together in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My name is Dave Madrano. This is my wife, Jocelyn, and we've been attending Christ Community Church since 2013. We're part of a journey group here, and uh, we're going to be missionaries in Cuba. The first time we thought about Cuba was um, when I was in the C4 leadership class um, with Pastor Mark. Um, the very first time he ever mentioned Cuba, I just like got so excited. I went straight home and told Dan about it. It was just stuck in our minds ever since. So we had the opportunity to go to Cuba ourselves um, last January and fell in love with it. It's been so cool to watch God just bring it up little by little again and again and just lead us there. I just never thought that I would be a missionary just because it was always really hard for me to serve and to give. But with the whole um, Beyond Belief initiative that, that we've been doing the past couple of years, it's just been really has helped me to really take that step of faith and, and go after what um, God has, has called us to do, and, and that, that's basically the Great Commission, go and make disciples and uh, proclaim His name and the good news. Especially because the doors to Cuba have been closed for so long, so now that they are finally open, um, I mean there's a lot of American churches that are excited to send people and send help and send aid, so um, when we went down there we, we did realize, I mean that's a huge need that we can help fill by organizing these teams, communicating with them, um, and leading them there, um, so that's a, a cool part of what we're going to be doing. We're not special, and we just want to give the glory to God, because it's Jesus who's the one who calls us um, to go and minister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he kind of just asks for a yes. He doesn't call qualified people. He just wants you to say yes to what he has planned. And that's another huge thing that we saw in Cuba, that God's already been at work. God is at work right now, and um, his kingdom is going to um, you know, break through in Cuba, and it already is, whether we're down there or not, but he has such amazing blessings um, ready if you just say yes. So right now we're actually starting the fundraising process, and we're excited about that. We are um, so excited to watch God work. Uh, we know it's all in His hands. We have 100% faith that He is going to raise up partners for us. So um, prayer partners, financial partners, that's what we're starting on right now. We finally have a date, so we're leaving in June of 2019 um, down to Miami um, to start our work. One of the cool things that's happening is that the church has given us actually $25,000 as startup expenses, mm -hmm. and that's all through the Beyond Belief initiative. It's it's really hard, you know, to give faithfully to something like that, and, and at first you don't really see the fruits, but it's gonna be so cool because like, this is the fruit. Thank you, Christ Community Church, um, for praying for us, for being friendly to us, for asking questions um, about our new journey that we're going to be taking. I have been just blown away by Christ Community. Just in the last um, nine months even, this church never ceases to amaze me and encourage me, and um, we love you so much, Christ Community. All right, can we praise Jesus for how he's at work with people right here in our very own city. Let's give it up for the Madranos and Jesus. <laughs> 
So like you guys just saw, Dan and Jocelyn Medrano are preparing to serve as missionaries in Cuba. And right now, they are looking for people to partner with them financially, but also partner with them in prayers and encouragement as they prepare for this journey as well. And I know you guys just saw most of their story on the video, but we actually have more for you. And they're going to be in the Hub article, which just released today. They're the cover story. And so these are completely free to you. You can pick them up after the services today. They're positioned on a bunch of different walls. And if you're joining us online, they're also available online, too. Just go to our website and search the Hub as well. I like to talk with my hands, so I'm dropping that. Um, as well, so the really cool thing about Dan and Jocelyn um, serving as missionaries in Cuba is that they also get to partner with another CCC missionary family, Matt and Terry Perotto, who are positioned in Miami, Florida right now. And this is going to be a part of a strategic staging ground for our future ministry work in Cuba. And the exciting thing is that the Madronos are actually preparing for a short-term mission trip coming up in February, and they are looking for a team of 8 to 12 people to go with them. So if God is stirring in your heart and you want to find out more information about what it's like to go on this trip, you can look it up online or the Perotos and the Madranos are both here today and you can find them out in the atrium after the services and they're willing to answer all of your questions about the mission trip. Well, at this time, I get to say the obvious thing, that the weather wasn't so good today. Uh, super snowy, really, really cold, but we're super thankful that you guys got to make it here today with us in the worship center. And if you're joining us online, we're excited too. I hope you're in your pajamas and you're super comfy and cozy. And regardless, we're just excited to be united in Christ this morning. Guys, and as I was praying this morning, I really sensed the Lord say, my people need a childlike faith. And so in the name of Jesus, I just bless us all with childlike faith and wonder. And snow isn't always exciting, but it can be. And so I just encourage you guys to adventure with Jesus today in that childlike faith. If that means playing in the snow or shoveling it, I believe that you can have fun doing it. And if you guys are new this morning, if there's anyone new in here, we would love to meet you after the services. And so if you can, make sure and stop by our Next Steps booth out in the atrium. We have a free gift waiting for you. And we'll give you an optional tour of our church if it's something that you'd like. So... Christmas is coming. I know, it's crazy, absolutely crazy. It's a few weeks away, but the really exciting thing is that Christmas is one of the most exciting times to invite all of your loved ones to the services at church because it helps us remember what Christmas is all about, the love and joy of Jesus. And we have two amazing opportunities for you guys to invite everyone to the services. The first one is coming up this next Sunday and that's going to be at 4 and 7 p.m. Our choir and orchestra is having their annual Christmas concert, and it's going to be wonderful, amazing, all of the things, plus bonus. It's free, which is great. We are encouraging anyone that can to bring gloves and hats for donations so that we can bless some students at Franklin Elementary if possible. And then the second opportunity is our Christmas Eve services are happening on Sunday the 20th third at 3 and 5 p.m. And then also Monday the 24th at 3, 5, and 7 p.m. So there are plenty of options for you guys. And they're all happening here in the worship center. And we'll also have children's ministry available for birth through four years old. So that's an option too. All right, guys, so as we've seen, God has been doing some amazing things right here in our city and throughout the world in places like Cuba as well. And this has been a part of the Beyond Belief vision where we desire to not just be people that live ordinary lives, but we desire to be people that live a life fully surrendered to God, trusting that he can do more than we can ever ask or imagine. And we have more about Beyond Belief and we have a special message from our lead pastor, Mark Ashton, that's gonna be on the screens to share that with you right now. 
Well, the Medranos and the Perotos are just two of the reasons why I am so excited about our Beyond Belief initiative. The impact that will be happening in Cuba and in Miami and all around the world, not to mention what's happening right here in our own backyard. And today I have the privilege of announcing to you the results of our midpoint refresh the commitment give that we've been engaging in over the last four weeks. You may remember that our original goal was to have $22 million released for the Beyond Belief initiative, and you guys have come through once again by the power of God, and the total pledge for this midpoint commitment exceeds $23.5 million. Let's give it up for Jesus and for the rest of this church and all the generosity that God has in store for all of us. Today is the date of the anniversary give where you bring your big commitment that's coming in for the end of the year, 2018. And I just wanna point you to the black boxes in the back of the room. We won't be processing to the front or passing the plates. Just bring your big anniversary gift to the boxes in the back of the room and celebrate together today. Hey, you may be wondering why I'm coming to you on video rather than live. Well, I am in Israel this week with a group of people from Christ Community who are walking where Jesus walked and experiencing God in some fresh ways. And you can join us on this journey by becoming my friend on Facebook or by liking the Christ Community Church Facebook page where you'll get daily video devotionals of what's happening in our lives in Israel, especially as it matches the story. But today your message is going to be coming from one of our staff pastors who's going to bring a fantastic talk on the prophet Elijah. So I would love to pray for us as we head into that message. Would you pray with me right now? Father, we're so grateful that you're communicating to us still thousands of years later after the events happen, that you communicate to us through your word, that you communicate to us through your servant and that you communicate to us through your Holy Spirit. So today we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and speak to our hearts. Change us from the inside out through the teaching of your word. We pray for your servant that he would be able to declare your word with boldness. And we invite this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Uh, fun to have Mark uh, join us from Israel, or at least via a video this morning. My name is Alex, and I'm so grateful uh, that you guys have chosen to come. I know some of you are like, you saw that video, you're like, Mark's not here. I braved the snow. <laughs> Who's this guy? Uh, I just pray ultimately that you wouldn't hear from me, but you would hear uh, from God this morning as we dive back into the story, which is uh, what we've been doing as a church since August. We've been going through a chronological version of the story and finding out what God has done in the lives of people. We found out that ultimately in every story, though there's these microscopic heroes, God is the ultimate hero in all of these stories. And so I'm excited to dive into the story with uh, Elijah today, and, and I hope you are as well. A few years ago, I uh, attended a marriage uh, seminar with my wife, which is a good thing to do, and they sent us to breakout sessions, and I went to a breakout session, and I remember the, the guy who was leading it, he asked the question uh, to begin the session, what is like the number one cause for divorce? What's the number one cause, just not even just for divorce, but for relationships to, to break apart? Why do relationships fall apart? And I remember uh, all of us guys in the room, this was a guys only seminar as we broke apart. We knew all the answers like men do. And so we all started shouting out all of the right answers. You know, sex is obviously an answer and guys just love yelling that word. Uh, the other answer was finances. You know, finances mess up relationships. Communication. It always causes things to fail, and with all the gusto and confidence, we shouted out all of these answers just for uh, the guy who was leading this seminar to look at us humbly, let us know we were all wrong. He said, no, th those aren't actually the answer. Those are maybe symptoms of the real answer, but he said, most relationships, why they fall apart, whether it's a marriage, whether it's you and a coach, whether it's a teacher and a student, whether it is somebody at a job, most relationships fall apart because of unmet expectations. 
We go into marriages with these expectations for how life should look, and then those expectations aren't met and things fall apart. We go into this new job that we are so excited about. They painted this grand picture for how we have unlimited time off, and it's going to be the best job we could ever experience, and we're going to have more family time, and we're going to make a difference in the world through our job. And slowly, unmet expectations creep in. Maybe it's a friendship, whatever it is, at the core of most relationships when they break up, it's due to unmet expectations. And this is the same when it comes to to God. We've seen this throughout the story over and over and over again. That God, in, in his goodness, he's given people expectations. He's given the Ten Commandments. He said, here, here's how you should live life. I wrote an entire book on it. This is what you should do. But over and over again, we find people failing to meet the expectations of God. Mark talked about it uh, last week a little bit about these kings that kept failing to meet God's expectations. Then there there was judges before that who kept failing to meet God's expectations. This whole nation of Israel who God wanted to preserve, they just kept failing to meet God's expectations. And so that's where we find ourselves today in the story is a guy probably more than any other who failed to meet God's expectations as the leader, as not just a king, but a spiritual leader of the nation of Israel. And so we'll dip back into chapter 14 really quick to get a little bit of a bio of this guy that we're going to be talking about. His name is is King Ahab. And so you can turn in your story if you've got that to page uh, 201. Otherwise, we'll be in 1 Kings uh, today, starting in chapter 16. And it reads like this. It says, In the 38th year of of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became the king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. This is a hard thing to muster and to match because these people were on a collision course doing so much evil. But he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any before him. He not only considered it just trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of an Ethbal king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all of the king's before him. This guy, he, he had quite the legacy that we're introduced to. Ahab, he's the worst king of them all. He did more to make God mad than any of the other kings. And so what God did out of his kindness was he, he sent this prophet to come and be the mouthpiece of God, to come and hopefully uh, pull the nation back and point them back to God as he had done over and over. After all these failed leaders, God would, out of his grace, send this amazing leader This time he sent a guy named Elijah. Elijah doesn't really have this huge pedigree behind his name. He doesn't have this dad who did ministry or was a pastor for 40 years. It just, we're introduced simply to Elijah the Tishbite. No big acclaim to his name. And we see that God wants uh, to send Elijah, to use Elijah to go let him know that the king is not meeting God's expectations. And because of this, there's going to be a penalty. There's going to be a punishment for not meeting God's expectations. So what God does is he sends Elijah to to King Ahab. He gets him in front of the king, which is a a miracle in in and of itself. And he says, hey, you are going to have to pay. You're not meeting God's expectations, so you're going to have to pay. And what you're going to have to do to pay is uh, I'm not going to send any rain for a while. There's not even going to be any condensation at all. No, do nothing until I say so. So Elijah, this random Tishbite, walks in and he he announces this to the king. And and this is a big deal that uh, God is sending Elijah to the king and and not just going after uh, just nothing, but he's going after the weather. Uh, Because what would have happened in this time, the the God of Baal, he was the weather God. He was kind of like the weather man. And he was the God who made it rain. And then it talks about this Asherah pole that they allowed to be built. And then Asherah was this, this goddess of fertility. 
This goddess that would make uh, things happen, would make families grow. If you were infertile, you would pray to the goddess uh, of Asherah, and she would make that happen. And, and then they had this really awesome idea. If you prayed to both gods, if you summoned both of them, they would consummate uh, together, and then that would cause rain, and it would cause life to, to fruit up. It would cause crops to grow, and then they would be blessed because they would have crops, and they would have all of this, this stuff to build their livelihood on. They would have food. And so God was going after the gods of the time directly. You've got this god of weather that you're relying on to make all of your money. You've, you've got this goddess of fertility to populate your country and to make uh, your livelihood. And God is going straight after these gods that the people had. And so God knew this wouldn't be a safe message for Elijah to deliver. So God sends him in there and he, he sneaks Elijah out. He says, I've got another plan for you. I need you to go uh, east uh, to this valley and there's going to be a brook there. Hang out by the brook. You'll have water because water is very scarce and you do that. And then God uh, invents the first food delivery service. Uh, actually, he invented this before, but he has a new messenger, a new delivery thing. Way before Uber Eats, God sent ravens. <laughs> God sends ravens uh, every single day to Elijah and provides him with meat and food. He's got a brook to, to be able to nourish himself every day. And he's just stuck there waiting, waiting for the next move, the next word from God. And then God does give Elijah a next place to go. This isn't in the story this week, but it's, it's a fascinating story from Elijah's life that leads up to where we're going. It, it was when God sends Elijah to the next place. He sends him right back into the middle of the idol worship. The brook, it says, was drying up in 1 Kings 16, and, and so he wasn't going to have any water, so he was faced with the choice to, to die of starvation and die of dehydration or maybe die by going back to the place everyone wanted to kill him because there was no rain, and this is the guy that brought it on them. And so God sends Elijah to an Airbnb of sorts. He hooks him up with this Airbnb of this widow uh, who had no food, and he knocks on the door. He's like, hey, could you hook me up with some food? And she's like, I, I don't have anything. And, God's, and Elijah says, hey, if you just take care of me, then God's not going to make you buy groceries or anything for a really long time as long as you hang out. And that's how I'm going to pay you. And so he does that over and over. And he, he pays even a bonus tip because this woman, uh, her son dies while Elijah's hanging out. And she's, she's just distraught, and she's in pain, and she, she can't believe her son dies. And Elijah even, even raises her son from the dead, there's a resurrection that happens in this, this woman's house because Elijah's faithful to God and he's hanging out there. He, he's seen these amazing things happen as a result of God's power, God's provision. God's taken care of him. He gave him a message and he said, hey, I'm going to take care of you. And so Elijah's waiting and waiting and waiting for the next thing to happen. And eventually God says after about three years, hey, I'm going to go send you on the mission that I've, I've built you for. Three years. Sometimes I, I think as we've been reading the story, it's easy for us to just read into things like, you know, Abraham and Sarah for a really long time, having to wait for that baby, or, or Joseph being in a pit for 14 years, or all of these different kinds of things. It's just easy to read over those times of waiting. But three years. <laughs> three years. God was trying to do something in Elijah. As I was reading this story and as I've been reading the story throughout this, I, I've been wondering, why all of the waiting, God? It seems like every single time you do something, if it's delivering your people from the hands of the Egyptians or whatever, it seems to be all of this waiting all of the time. And I'm a guy who does not like waiting. <laughs> we live in a microwave culture where I, I just do not like waiting for anything. I can drive up to a, a drive through and have my hot meal as fast as I, as I want it. I don't like waiting. Why all of the waiting all of the time? And it doesn't explicitly say here, but I think we can garner this from reading the story over and over. I know from my own life, there's been seasons of waiting where I'm like, God, why? As a matter of fact, the last couple of years, I've been in one of these seasons where I felt God asking me to do something, stirring something inside of me, and I had no clue what it was. But it seems like in the middle of the season, I just keep having things go wrong, <laughs> A little bit over a year ago, I lost a boss to, to some decisions that he, he had made. And I'm like, God, what, what are you, what's happening here? 
I had put together a, a great team to do ministry, and, and those people ha- had to go for various reasons and, and leave the ministry. The people who had been serving for decades in the ministry that I got the privilege of leading, they, ha- they had to move on. And, and I was like, God, what are you doing? How am I supposed to build this ministry? What in the world is happening inside of here in our, in our own personal lives with me and my wife, we had an idea of what our family was going to look like. We've had ideas of how we were going to move on and create a different life. And God has brought things into our life that's caused us to question that. To wonder, God, what are you doing? Couldn't you have just taught me through someone else's story? And why does it have to keep adding up one thing after another after another? Why all of the waiting? God, why do you have to really remove all of my comfort and my control and my convenience? I love those things. And I've sensed God over this season of my life as I've lost comfort and control and convenience, building this deep reliance on him. And God has shown up in some incredible ways, and I've been able to look back and say, man, I, I couldn't have done this on my own. God, you have shown up and you have been faithful. I think sometimes in seasons of waiting, we're like, God, what in the world are you doing? I think in Elijah's life, in this season of waiting, I think sometimes God knows that he has to do something in us before he can do something through us. And this is what's happening in Elijah's life. God had to do something in Elijah and be faithful over and over before he could make and do something through Elijah. Because what Elijah was about to do next was epic. And God wanted to build up this, this faith inside of Elijah. And so after providing ravens for him and providing food for this woman and raising this person from the dead, Elijah was finally ready for the mission, the mission that God had sent him on. So he sends him to go before the king, even though he had him the first time and he could have just done all of this and challenged the king the first time, God wanted to do something in Elijah so he could do something through Elijah to build up that faith. And we find in the story that God sends him to the king. It says the king, when he, Ahab, saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah's like, hey, slow your roll here, man. I have not made trouble for Israel. But you and your father's family, you have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands. You've followed the Baals. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. I want you to bring 450 of the prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Elijah's calling the king out and he's calling out the king's God. He's saying, hey, we're about to have this epic showdown on Mount Carmel. I want you to get all of the people of Israel, get them to show up, get the prophets of Baal, stack your numbers. You've got 450. Bring the prophets of Asherah. Bring all the people that you can because I am challenging you to something. It would kind of look like all of you people in the crowd versus me. (laughs) I don't trust those odds uh, uh, very much. Unless I know that I've got a God who is going to do something crazy and miraculous inside of this story. And so that is what happens. It says, Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and he assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and he said to them, how long are you going to waver between two opinions? He stands out there. People, how long are you going to waver between these two opinions? If the Lord is God, then just follow him. It's that simple. But if, if Baal is God, follow him. Two pretty easy choices. You can't just stand in the middle. And he challenges these people with that. And it says after that, but the people said nothing. At this point in Elijah's story, he had so much confidence in God. God had been doing something in Elijah because he was going to do something through Elijah in this moment. He had all of the reason to have confidence. Ravens feeding him, this woman uh, seeing a guy raised from the dead through God's power. He had so much confidence that God was going to do something incredible and powerful in this moment. And so we see the, the, the scene start to take place. Uh, Elijah challenges these gods and these prophets to a fire-making contest. He says, all right, on top of this, we'll both build altars. There's two bulls. I'll let you pick which bull you want first. 
This is going to be an epic showdown. We've got the crowd here to watch on. You start to build this thing, and we're going to see whose God can make the fire happen first. It hadn't rained in a long time, so everything was pretty dry. They build up this altar, uh, and they start chanting to their God. They're like, God, make this happen. They're yelling to Baal, and they're like, make this happen. Make this fire. This should be really easy. We've given, uh, the other God's given you three years of just drought, and everything's dry. You've got the bull that you want. You get to cut it up, and whatever kind of pieces that you want. The people start shouting out to their God, and Silence. And so Elijah, he, he starts to press into these people a little bit more. He's like, hey, I know nothing's happening. Maybe your God, he's just taking a nap. Maybe, uh, maybe he's, you know, trying to get some stamps on his passport. He, he's traveling somewhere. Maybe he's just busy. If you guys yell louder, then maybe your God is going to answer. He starts to taunt these people because he had so much confidence in what God was about to do. And so the people, they, they take it up another level. They start shouting louder and louder their God. They start to cut themselves so they bleed. They go all out so they can do whatever they can to get their God to wake up and make this happen. These people were really desperate in this moment for their God to show up. They were desperate because there was, there was this law in the land that if you were found out to be a false prophet, you'd have to be executed. So these people didn't just show up there just hoping their God would do something. They were putting their lives on the line, praying to this, this God, hoping something would happen. And so was Elijah, and they kept doing this over and over. It says they did it from morning until noon, and they did it from noon until about dinner time. And then Elijah's like, all right, my turn. I've given you a whole day's head start. I'm going to start to finally build my altar now. If your eight-hour head start wasn't enough, I'm going to build my altar now. I'm going to put my bull finally on this thing. And I'm going to do something just crazy. The people probably thought he was a, a psycho. He starts digging a ditch around this thing, and he starts to say, hey, I need you to pour water and water and water on this thing. But he had so much confidence that God was going to show up that he was doing crazy things. And we see that he, he, he gets this altar ready. He, he pours water in this. There's ditches around it, and he starts to pray to his God with so much boldness and so much confidence, asking God that he would show up in this moment because he knew if God would show up, then the people would have no choice. They would have to pick the God of Israel. It would be clear at this point. They would no longer sit on the fence choosing gods. They would have to pick this God. And so he, he prays and he says, God, show up. And God, out of nowhere, just drops this pillar of fire and burns everything up in this epic scene that Hollywood could not even recreate. It was completely epic. It says that it burnt up the bull, it burnt up the stones, it, it licked up the water inside of the trenches. This epic scene had just happened. And the people, they fell down saying, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. One of the most epic scenes, I think, in all of Scripture just happened. He had so much faith in God. And what happens next is Elijah goes and he says, hey, Ahab, rain's about to come, buddy. You're going to want to get on your horse and your chariots. You're going to want to get back before the storm comes and wipes you guys out. Rain is finally coming. This is good news. And so he sends the people Ahab and his warriors back. The prophets of Baal are killed because they're found out to be false prophets. Things are really, really looking so good. And he sends Ahab back. And then there's this other small part. I don't know if you caught it where the Lord did this incredible thing where it says he tucks in his, in his cloak. And then he outruns the horses and the chariots about 18 miles, the fastest 30K ever to beat him back to this place. God shows up again. But for all of these people who were shouting and screaming to their God, they were met with unmet expectations. They were bleeding for their God, and somehow still he wasn't meeting the expectations they had, and ultimately it led them to death. But Elijah had just seen the victory of the Lord, and he, he heads back, and he, he is so excited, probably running back on his 30K, preparing his victory speech in his mind. Ahab goes to his crazy, evil wife, Jezebel, tells her the entire story. Uh, Elijah is waiting for them to come out with a white flag and say, you're right, your God is the real God. We have seen it. We've seen his power. We've seen all of these things. So Jezebel does. She sends a message to Elijah. But no white flag. 
She actually doubles down. She says, hey, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. This epic scene had just happened, and she says, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. And so Elijah, he, he runs in fear. He had just seen the most epic showdown, the most epic portion of God's power on display, and he had seen it in small glimpses throughout his, his story and his life of waiting, but he had just seen incredible power of God on display on Mount Carmel, the most amazing mountaintop experience one could ever have, but yet here's Elijah. If we keep reading, he now is the one with unmet expectations. See, Elijah uh, thought in this moment that if God would just come down, then people would choose gods, that Jezebel and Ahab, they would have to to disown their God, disavow their God. They would have to make the nation turn back to, to God. The nation of Israel would finally turn back to God, but that's not what happens here. After the greatest display of God's power that we've seen, that's not what happens here. And Elijah, he's defeated. A guy who just saw God show up less than 24 hours later is running for his life. Not only is he running for his life, he, he just wants to give up. He, he tells his servant, hey, your, your job is done here. I, I, I'm going to start to pray. He starts to pray to God. He's like, God, I've done my ministry part, man. I've done what you called me to do. I, I've done what you've invited me to do. You showed up and just take me. I don't know if it's working. Kill me now. I mean, he is so desperate and in so much pain, and it says that he went to a place to just go hide away. He's exhausted. He falls asleep. And out of God's goodness, he sends an angel, and the angel comes to him and and gives him some food to eat to nourish him, and Elijah falls back asleep. Angel wakes him again out of God's goodness and says, hey, I've got some food for you. He gives him this food so he could go on this journey that he would take next. And Elijah, what he does next is maybe wanting to figure out what in the world God's doing. Maybe he has some questions for God. What in the world just happened? Why isn't this this country turned around? They just saw your power on display. And it says that he, he made this journey to Mount Horeb, which we are familiar with reading the story because this is where God showed up to a guy named Moses. And so he travels there maybe hoping to, to see, to hear from God, get an explanation, figure out what is going on. God, why have you not met my expectations? I expected this all to be fixed by now. And so that's what he does. He goes to Mount Horeb. After this 30-day journey, he, he crawls into this cave and he starts hearing things. On page 207 in 1 Kings 19, it says, The word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replies in his desperate voice, I have, I have been so zealous for the Lord God Almighty. God, I've been so zealous for you. The Israelites, they've rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put prophets to death with the sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. God, what is happening here? I've done everything that you invited me to do. I've seen your power at work, and now they want to kill me. This isn't what I imagined happening when you showed up on Mount Carmel. And then it says the Lord talks to Elijah. He says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, absolutely ripped the mountains apart, and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was this insane earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord, he was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went out and just stood there in the mouth of the cave. Some scholars have suggested because we hear God talking over and over and we see the words of God clearly as he invites him out. Some have suggested that that gentle whisper was just divine silence. 
that the God of the universe had just invited Elijah to come and experience divine silence. His presence in that moment. And then it says, then a voice came to him. It's like deja vu. What are you doing here, Elijah? Why are you here? And Elijah says again, God, I've been so zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites, they've rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put to death your prophets by the sword. Am I the only one left? And now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah's complaining. He's telling God about his unmet expectations, how God hasn't shown up the way that he wanted, and now he's the only one left. He, he's on an island alone. God, what are you going to do? This isn't how I plan things to happen. I, I, I've been so faithful to you. How does this even happen, God? Anyone else ever been there? In your life, you have seen God's power on display. God has invited you to do incredible things. You've had incredible mountaintop experiences. You've been praying for someone. You've seen glimpses of hope. You've had expectations for how God was going to show up, and he does show up, and then the results look a little different than what you thought they should have. And so you get weary. You want to run away from God. You're like, God, I, I don't know what you're doing. I know I've seen your power. It's so clear I can't deny that your power is there. But what is happening here? Elijah, he responded with that same answer with his unmet expectations. And, and then God and his goodness, he reminds him he's not alone. Elijah, I know you feel alone, but my presence is here. And then he tells him, besides his presence being here, he's got this remnant of people that are going to be back waiting for him, and victory is still going to happen, baby, not in the way that Elijah at first anticipated. He's like, hey, I've got this covered. I've got my plan covered. I've, I've got this under control. I just want to be with you. See, the plan that God had that we, we see happen from the beginning of the story and that we'll see unfold at the end of the story, the plan has always been God's presence. Yes, God wants to put his power on display and he, he wants to draw people uh, to his name through those things, but God always draws people ultimately by his presence. So hundreds of years later, the plan was still his presence. We'll read more and more about the narration of the story that happens, but ultimately, hundreds of years later, there would be these people screaming that song. We sang it so beautifully earlier, but these people were probably begging, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. God, come and be with us. They were looking for a king that would come and rule once and for all, a king that was good, a king that would wipe out all of their enemies, a king that was going to be awesome and epic and powerful in all of these ways that they expect victory to happen. They were expecting a, a brave hero, a brash conqueror, a beloved king, but instead, what did the people get? A baby born in a barn? <laughs> Killed by a beating? Could anything good come from Nazareth? The people said. They were expecting a valiant warrior, a visionary leader, and a vivacious victor, but what did they get? The son of a virgin who would be a vagabond and would later just die a victim. The baby named Jesus would come as Emmanuel, God with us, the God who is present with his people. And I think though most of us are convinced of this fact, most of us are convinced of God's sheer power, most of us have maybe sensed God's power sometimes or at some other point in our life. I wonder how much of us are convinced about that baby. I wonder how many of us are convinced that simply God's presence is enough. It's the answer to all of our solutions. I don't know if there's another time inside of the calendar where we have to wrestle with this more, and maybe that's more unclear that in what we believe about the presence of God and how we want God 
to show up. We turned to something newer and better because the something newer and better we got last year didn't actually fulfill us and didn't give us our expectations. The expectations aren't being met in our marriage. The expectations aren't being met in our jobs, in our careers, in our bank accounts. Our expectations aren't being met for how we planned life to happen. And so we turn to something maybe new that will meet our expectations. Maybe we're not convinced that, that that baby in the manger who came to be Emmanuel was simply all God had planned. That God's presence was enough. But we see in Elijah's story, his presence was enough. Maybe some of you here today are chasing Mount Carmel experiences. God, if you would just show up in this way, if this person would just turn their life towards you, if you would just drop this amount of money in my bank account, if I could have this thing that I've been praying for, then God, I will really be all in for you. If I could just have that, God, if you would just meet my expectations, then I will follow you. But friends, can I tell you that Jesus didn't actually come to meet all the expectations that we had. Jesus had to come because we couldn't meet God's expectations. That is the good news of Christmas, is that God, the God of the universe, he didn't come to meet our expectations the way we think life should play out. He came because we couldn't meet his So we don't have to live this life trying to make this fake nice list and try to stay off this fake naughty list. He came because we couldn't meet his expectations. And maybe that sounds brash, but that is very actually good news for us. I love how uh, Paul David Tripp put it in the Advent Devo I was reading the other day. He said, without the presence, the life, and the work of that baby in a manger, there's no light at the end of the tunnel for sinners. Jesus came, he he came to do the unexpected, to live a a perfect life, only to be rejected, beaten, mocked, that cute little baby in the manger. And he did this all out of love, an insane amount of love so that you, this Christmas, tomorrow, the day after, the day after, the day after, the day after, could experience his presence. The presence of the God of the universe. I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it. He says, it seems that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but they're just too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like ignorant children who wants to go ahead and make mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. If most of us got what we were expecting, we'd be far too easily pleased, but the God of the universe came to crash into humanity, came to to be human and divine at the same time so he could come and give us not what we expected, but what we need and what we couldn't earn on our own. I think that's why Jesus taught us to pray, not my will, God, not my expectations, but your expectations, your will be done. That's why he invites us to abide in him. He says, hey, you've got to abide in me, and if apart from me, you can do nothing. Do we actually believe that? Apart from the presence of God, we can do nothing. This is, this is really, really good news because the God of the universe has invited us, that Jesus came ultimately to come and live as a cute baby, to die, and out of love, give us access to his presence on a daily basis, to be Emmanuel, God with us. And he, he actually came and paved the way for his Holy Spirit to come and be present inside of us in every single moment, at every single hour that we have access to the presence of the God of the universe. His power is really cool. The presence that he can give us are really cool and nice and cute, but his presence, his presence is the greatest gift there ever was. And so this morning, I want to give you a moment, a moment in the middle of the first day of Advent, a moment in one of the craziest months of the year, a moment when we're searching for something newer and better to fill that hole that something newer and better didn't fill last year, to spend time, to spend a moment 
in the presence of God. Maybe you're searching for a Mount Carmel experience and begging God for that, and he wants to give you a Mount Oreb experience this morning. Divine silence before the God of the universe. And so I'm going to give that to you. We want to give that to you as a gift this morning. Whether you're here in person or online, I, I just encourage you at home or wherever you're watching to just have a moment of silence and enjoy the presence of God. We'll sing a song after that. But don't rush into what your plans are, but just spend a moment in the presence of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your presence. God, in the middle of a season where there's a longing for more, a loneliness, God, it's your presence that makes us full. Our presence that, your presence that brings fullness of joy. In your presence, we are made complete. And God, my prayer for us today is the same prayer that Paul prayed for the early church. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and in peace believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. In your name, amen. Thanks for being here, friends. We will see you next week. Safe travels home.